Good morning, ladies. We're going to go ahead and get started. Let's pray. Oh, precious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace this morning, God, and we praise you. We praise you for who you are, our amazing God who is slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. You are merciful and gracious, Lord God. And we also know after studying this week that you are a jealous God. And Lord, I pray that um, as we begin our study of Nahum, that you would just reveal yourself to us, Lord. Gently lead us through these next couple of weeks, God, and help us to understand why this book is so important uh, in understanding who you are. God, I pray that you would be glorified in a mighty, mighty way today. May everything that is said and done here this morning be honoring and glorifying to you. And I just pray that I would decrease and you would increase right now. Be present here among us this morning, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, you're probably familiar with this scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Do you believe this? I mean, like, really believe it. How many of you have read Nahum before this class? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have studied Nahum before this class? <laughs> Just as I suspected. Not one hand. Okay, one more question. How many of you have heard a sermon series preached on Nahum? Again, no hands. <laughs> uh, it may be no surprise to you then to learn that the book of Nahum is quite possibly the least read, the least studied, and the least preached of all the scriptures. In fact, of the seven pastors that I usually listen to uh, sermons online as I'm preparing, I found only two sermons on Nahum. And I mean, I had to search really hard for them. <laughs> only two, okay? Okay. So think about this, very few people will probably ever study the book of Nahum. And I understand why, I get it. Judgment is definitely a heavy topic and not something that we're excited to dig into. Um, it's one that might be difficult. And in fact, this, this book is a little bit difficult for us to understand and for sure to identify with, especially being women living in the Western world, right? I think it's funny because an Avenger can actually be a superhero in the movies, but when we talk about God as an Avenger, it gives us pause. But we know for sure from the scriptures that God does care about justice. And I actually find the lack of familiarity uh, fascinating because if you think about it, the book of Jonah which we just finished studying, is probably one of the most familiar and famous stories in all of scripture. And the book of Nahum is essentially its sequel. So think about that. It's the sequel, and Jonah is really well known, but Nahum? No. God sent a word of warning to Nineveh, if you'll remember, through the prophet Jonah. Divine judgment would come if the people of Nineveh did not repent and turn from their evil ways. Well, we know from studying Jonah that the people of Nineveh did repent and God did relent from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them. Then we saw how Jonah burned with anger, remember? Because the Lord chose to show mercy and compassion toward the enemies of his people. But we have to remember that God's ways are higher than our ways. When God does not respond as we think he should or when we think he should, it isn't that he's doing nothing. And I think sometimes, don't we think that? It seems like God isn't doing anything about this. But the fact is 
that what's happening is his mercy and compassion and patience at work. It does not mean that God is powerless, even though sometimes it feels like he's powerless in these moments. I think we're projecting our feelings of powerlessness onto him. So we know that Jonah did not understand, nor did he trust the sovereign plan of God. But the Lord knew that Nineveh's repentance would not endure. Just a few generations later, the people returned to their violent and evil ways. And this was at a time that uh, the Assyrian Empire was at the height of its power. More than a hundred years after Nineveh repented, Nahum declared that God would fulfill his promise to execute divine judgment against this capital of the Assyrian Empire. The words of this book they will make us uncomfortable. I mean, it's just no way to get around it. They're gonna make us uncomfortable, but as we work our way through each chapter over the next few weeks, I really pray that we will see how this oracle could bring comfort and even encouragement to God's people and even cause them to rejoice. For God is the righteous judge and evil will not go unpunished. Judgment will come at the appointed time. God will make all things right. And in Nahum 1, this week, we're going to see the God of perfect justice. We'll see God's wrath and power. We'll see a wicked plot, so to speak, and a word of peace. Because in seeking vengeance against the oppressor of his people, the Lord simultaneously shows mercy to the oppressed because the sovereign Lord of all creation is the God of perfect justice. He is glorified in both retribution and redemption. Now, before we begin reading, we're going to orient ourselves in the context, okay? So real quickly, The literary context, the book of Nahum, like the book of Jonah, is one of the 12 minor prophets. Remember, it's not minor in importance, it's just minor in size. It's only three chapters, so it's small. While the book of Jonah focused on God's mercy toward the repentant, and it reminded us that God is slow to anger, the book of Nahum focuses on God's judgment for the wicked and unrepentant, reminding us that God will by no means clear the guilty. This prophetic oracle is written entirely in Hebrew poetry. The vivid imagery paints a sobering picture of God's divine wrath. So let's look at our timeline. Remember our timeline from the beginning, first week, the grand narrative? This gives us the biblical context. So if you look at the timeline, in the mid to late 700s BC, that's where the book of Jonah is along the line of history. Then in 722 BC, we see that Israel, the northern kingdom, did fall to the Assyrians. And then later in 663 BC, the Egyptian capital of Thebes falls to the Assyrians. And this is important because this is actually mentioned in chapter three of Nahum. So it gives us, it helps to give us the timeline of when this book was probably written. So if you think about the top being 663 BC and then the bottom in 612, that is when Nineveh actually did fall to the Babylonians. So that obviously came after the prophecy. So somewhere in between there, between 663 BC and 612 BC is when the book of Nahum was written and falls. Now we have to remember that Nineveh was a real place. It was a massive city with walls, some of them as high as 100 feet. It had a huge moat surrounding it. It was almost 150 feet wide and apparently 60 feet deep. That is huge. Uh, It seemed like an impenetrable city, but it was not impenetrable, impenetrable to the Lord. 
the city was utterly destroyed and actually forgotten for centuries. It was not until 1842 when it was actually rediscovered and they began to excavate that site. I didn't know that uh, actually before I was studying, so I thought that was really interesting. There are actually relics in museums around the world that include books and reliefs and uh, pieces of their artwork. And it's interesting to note that a lot of their artwork shows just how much they celebrated the violence of their culture. So uh, if you're interested, you can look online and <laughs> see some of those things. Now, we know, too, that there are a couple of allusions to other passages of Scripture in this text, and so I'll kind of weave them in as we go through. Uh, I also wanted to show you a map. For me, I'm a very visual person, and I know this is not the greatest map, but the reason I chose it is because if you see, okay, there's two black lines that I've added here, arrows. The arrow at the bottom pointing to like this little purplish blue circle that is Judah, okay? So just imagine, you see all the sort of beigey orange color, that is the Assyrian Empire. But that little blue is Judah, right in the middle. So just think about what it must have felt like for these people. They were surrounded by their enemies, and their enemies were really ready to take them down. And they had actually attempted that. Uh, I'll talk about that later. So just to give you a picture, and then the other arrow up at the top is just pointing to where the actual city of Nineveh is. So to give you an idea of um, where it is on a map, I think is helpful. So the author of this book is Nahum of Elkosh. There is no background information about him in the scriptures. And <laughs> So we don't even know if Elkosh is actually his birthplace or if it was the place of his ministry. Uh, Nahum sounds like a Hebrew word that's associated with comfort. And so Nahum could be translated God comforts, which seems like quite an ironic name, don't you think, for a book about judgment and divine wrath. Uh, but as we will see, God shows compassion to his people through vengeance on their cruel enemies. He is both just and merciful. So we have to remember that as we're going through this. So the audience is actually twofold. The author directly addresses the oppressors, the people of Nineveh. But he also addresses the people who are oppressed, the people of Judah, and then I thought this was interesting too. It's possible that there were still some believers in Nineveh. So I just wonder what those people must have been thinking when this message came. I mean, this was a point when they were going to have to choose whether they were going to be loyal and stand up for the Lord or be loyal to their nation. I don't know. I just, I thought that was interesting to, to think about. The Assyrian Empire was the dominant power from about 900 to 600 BC, so for 300 years. And over the course of that time, their rule extended from Mesopotamia all the way down to even parts of Egypt. The northern kingdom of Israel fell to Assyria in 722 BC. And then in 701 BC, Assyria did attack Judah. But even though Judah was greatly weakened, they did not fall, which again, just so encouraging to look at this map and see they were still there. Weakened and people were taken, but they did not fall. Instead, what happened is they actually became a vassal state and they were subject to the Assyrians' rule. They were forced to pay taxes and to pay homage to the king. And any type of re rebellion that they would have tried would have absolutely been shut down. Remember, these were very violent and cruel people beheading and flaying and uh, impaling their enemies. So the people of Judah had to accept the Assyrians and they actually exploited all of the natural resources there. And they also were forced to sometimes contribute soldiers even to the military of Assyria, which is pretty crazy to think about. 
So just imagine what it would have been like to live in Nahum's day. Put yourself in the mindset of these people. All right, so let's go ahead and read Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Again, just, just picture this. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Wow. So an oracle is a communication from God. It can either be a divine response to a question that was asked or just a pronouncement that is made by the Lord. It reveals God's view or perspective of the circumstances. So if you think about it, this is God's view, God's perspective of what is happening. The imagery painted by this oracle is vivid because Nahum received it as a vision. So somehow, in some way, he saw this. Some translations use the word burden or burden against Nineveh instead of oracle in verse 1. This emphasizes the heaviness or the weight of this message of doom, this woe pronounced against Nineveh. This book, no doubt, is about God. Uh, I just started listing all the repetition of the Lord is blank. So verse 2, we have the Lord is jealous, he is avenging, he is wrathful. In verse 3, we see the Lord is slow to anger, he is great in power. In verse 7, the Lord is good. He is a stronghold. Also, did you notice all the verbs that were used in this passage? It shows us that he is an active God. I just listed a few. In verse 2, he takes vengeance and keeps wrath. Verse 4, he rebukes and he dries up. In verse 7, he knows Verse 8, he pursues his enemies. Did you notice that? Thinking about how he pursued Jonah, now we see he will pursue his enemies just as fiercely. In verse 12, he afflicts. Verse 13, he breaks and he bursts. In verse 14, he cuts off. And then look at creation's response to him. In verse 5, it said, the mountains quake the hills melt, the earth heaves. Just picture this. When we are suffering, nothing will comfort us like a right understanding of God's character. And I think this book is gonna challenge us and challenge our assumptions about him. I think it's gonna just blow away the box. That's what I'm hoping for. It's already doing that for me. The Lord is rightly jealous for his glory, for his name, and for the heart of his people. The New International Version uh, commentary, I think, was really helpful here. I'm going to read an excerpt from it. It said, God's wrath and vengeance is a response to those who destroy what God loves. The context of his vengeance 
is his righteous jealousy against his enemies. His jealousy compels him to act to protect his name and his people. So his jealousy is not like ours, okay? His jealousy is right and righteous and holy. And this idea of jealousy, think of it more as him being zealous, okay? Zealous. God's jealousy, again, it's not like our jealousy because it has its ultimate grounding within him himself. He alone can be jealous, right? No one is like him. God is rightly jealous because he made us and his people belong to him and we should love him for he has purchased us with countless acts of deliverance. Even though we and our enemies and they and their enemies often pretend that we don't belong to him. God is not possessed by his wrath. He has mastered it, okay? His wrath is used for his purposes against those who are hostile or personally antagonistic toward him. So again, this is how his jealousy is, and wrath is different from ours. Nineveh's attacks on God's people are essentially an attack on himself, and we've seen that over and over in the scriptures, have we not? The other attribute that really stood out to me is verse seven. The Lord is good. Short, simple, but so profound. Think about this. This fact matters. This needs to be here because we need to know that God is good. God is omnipotent, but... If we cannot trust that he will use his power rightly, it would not bring any comfort to us, would it? Likewise, if he was good but impotent and had no power at all to act to bring about this good, how could that be comforting either? It would not be. It would not be an encouragement at all. Then verse 8 says, there, I, I thought this was so cool. Okay, it's this imagery of the flood, but with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries. Did anyone think of Genesis when they were reading that? Genesis 6. Listen to Genesis 6, 5, and 7. This isn't about the flood, but this is about the wickedness of the people at the time of the flood. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. Just think about this. I I, I just thought this is a picture of what he did back in Genesis. And only those who were safe within the refuge of the ark The people and the animals within the ark were the only ones who survived that flood. So who can stand? Who can stand before the just and holy creator of the universe? None. None but Jesus. He is our only hope. We must turn from our sin and our rebellion and take refuge in the life, death, burial, and resurrection, the work of Jesus Christ. Now, one of the allusions that I talked about, I wanted to share with you, is Psalm 46. So if you will turn to Psalm 46 with me, I just want to read this to you. It's, again, as we read through it, you will hear the connections with this passage. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. 
God will help her when morning dawns. Just think about how encouraging this would be if they remembered these words. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The sovereign Lord of all creation is the God of perfect justice, glorified in both retribution and in redemption. Let's look at verses 9 through 11 in Nahum 1. Starting with verse 9. What do you plot against the Lord? He will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise up a second time. For they are like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They are consumed like stubble fully dried. From you came one who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. Nineveh's opposition was violent and cruel. And in a sense, their evil consumed everything in its path. They stripped the land, they ate all the fruit of the land, and they even, as one commentator noted, consumed the bars of city gates in fire. Now, the Lord is flipping it, and they're going to be the ones consumed. In verses eight and nine, uh, it repeats, he will make a complete end. And then in verse 9, trouble will not rise up a second time. Nineveh's reign of terror is over. Notice the words also change. In verse 9 and 11, instead of using the they and them, twice he uses you. What do you plot against the Lord? From you, Nineveh, came one who plotted evil against the Lord. It almost sends shivers up your spine uh, to, to hear this change, right? This change of tone. And this, this last verse, verse 11, almost seems to hint at even a satanic influence behind this evil king. Does, don't you think? One thing I think that is important to note here at this point is... Um, that it's difficult for us today to hear these words of judgment as living words of judgment against us or against people that we love. But only in this way will the text serve to call us to humble ourselves before God and call upon his mercy. So it's important for us to remember that it applies and is relevant to us today too. All who are not in Christ are enemies of God. Romans 5, 8 through 11 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Nicholas Reed said, we never want to take the posture that the world is bad, that we deserve God's mercy, but they don't, because none of us deserve God's mercy. The sovereign Lord of all creation is the God of perfect justice, 
glorified in both retribution and redemption. Let's look at the last few verses. Starting with verse 12. Thus says the Lord, though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. And now I will break his yoke from off you and will burst your bonds apart. The Lord has given commandment about you. No more shall your name be perpetuated. From the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the metal image. I will make your grave for you are vile. Behold upon the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Keep your feasts, O Judah, fulfill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. So verse 12 is a word of reversal as the slave becomes free. God's people will be strengthened and restored And verse 15, this proclamation of peace for the oppressed, this passage is also an allusion to uh, an important text, Isaiah 52. Let's see. I'm just going to read the first seven verses. If you want to flip there, you can flip there. Isaiah 52 says, Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust and arise. Be seated, O Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, My people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. Now, therefore, what have I here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing? Their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name, Therefore, in that day, they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Your God reigns. Is this not the message the Lord meant for the original audience to hear? And is this not the message he also wants to encourage us with today? Our God reigns. That is the good news. And not just that he defeats sin in the world, but also sin within our evil hearts. Think about that. He is glorified both in judging sin and in saving from sin. As the Lord carried out retribution against the sin of Nineveh, he was simultaneously redeeming his people, rescuing them from destruction. What an incredible picture. It should just be screaming to us from the text. Satan, sin, and death are the real enemies. And Christ overcame every one of them. Every one, all of them. In Christ, God is glorified in both retribution and redemption. We should look forward to the day that everyone will know and everyone will see his victory. The Lord poured out his wrath on Jesus. Retribution for our sin. We deserve to be cut off, separated from God for all of eternity. But Jesus chose to be cut off, to be forsaken. He endured the unimaginable. Just remember him speaking from the cross, declaring, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was unimaginable what he endured. 
In the end, God's judgment will fall either on Christ or on us, and it is our choice. 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 12 says, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark O'Donohue says, by rubbing our noses in the horror and humiliation of God's enemies, Nahum helps us to see the wonder of our salvation. Think about that. The sovereign Lord of all creation is the God of perfect justice, glorified in both retribution and redemption. So if you are a Christian, you probably or you should expect attacks to come from unbelievers on the outside or outside of your circle of influence. But there's nothing, I don't know if you will agree with me, but I think there's nothing quite as painful as an attack that comes from the inside. I personally have had two family members turn on me because of my faith in Christ. Um, One actually, harassed me with letters, emails, and phone calls for months. And it happened to be a member of my dad's family, and so he actually stepped in, and he was the one that helped to stop it. The other was an especially difficult situation. And I can't go into the details, but I am not exaggerating to you when I say that things escalated to the point where I felt as if that person, every time they saw me, would spit on me if they could. Like, it was that extreme of a situation. They became my judge, they became my jury, and I think if someone allowed them to, they would have become my executioner too. And at the time, I, I didn't realize that it really wasn't about me. I felt like it was about me. It was really hard, and I felt completely helpless to deal with it because there was nothing that I could do or say to defend myself. So one morning, I was actually overcome. I was driving home from dropping my daughter off, and I was overcome by this urge to call my dad. Because I just wanted someone to fight for me. Have you ever felt like that? Like you just wanted someone to fight for you. I I always wished that I had an older brother. I'm the oldest. I always wished I had an older brother that could just come in and fight against the bullies, you know, beat up the bullies for me. Well, instead of making that phone call, I grab my Bible and I often pray through the Psalms. And at this particular period of time, I was praying uh, literally whatever corresponded to the day. And so it happened to be the seventh. And so I turned to Psalm seven and I started reading. And I'm using a different Bible. This is my NASB because this is the one that I was actually using that day. And I have notes written all over it, but Turn with me to Psalm 7. I want to read this to you. And I hope it'll become clear as as we go. Okay, verse 1. O Lord my God, in you I have taken refuge. 
save me from all those who pursue me and deliver me, or he will tear my soul like a lion, dragging me away while there is none to deliver. O oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is injustice in my hands, if I have rewarded evil to my friend or have plundered him who without cause was my adversary, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him trample my life down to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift up yourself against the rage of my adversaries and arouse yourself for me. You have appointed judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples encompass you and over them return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Vindicate me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and my integrity that is in me. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. For the righteous God tries the hearts and minds. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. So if you can imagine by this point, I mean, the tears are just flowing down my face. I mean, I just felt like there's nothing like scripture to speak what you're feeling. I realized in that moment that I didn't need to call my dad because God fights for me. He was fighting for me. And in the meantime, as I continued to read, he even began working on my heart. Listen to this. Look at verses 12 through 16. If a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. He has also prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, he travails with wickedness and he conceives mischief and brings forth falsehood. He has dug a pit and hollowed it out and has fallen into the hole which he made. His mischief will return upon his own head. Now this is a person that I love dearly. And this image of a sharpened sword and this bow bent and made ready, it actually drove me to pray like I never had before. Not for God's justice on my behalf, but for God's mercy on that person that I love. God did a great work in my heart. And instead of seeking someone to fight for me, I actually began fighting on behalf of that person who was hurting me. I prayed for that person, and I'm telling you, over time, God has redeemed that relationship in a way that only he can. I'm still not 100% sure that this person has come to know the Lord, but God is working. God is working. If God is for us, who can be against us? Vengeance is not ours. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. God will make all things right. Will you choose to trust in the sovereign Lord of creation for his perfect justice in his perfect timing? Let's pray. Oh, Lord God. It's humbling to see your character on display in this way and to know the way that you work, Lord God, on our behalf. Lord, I just pray that you would help us as we go through these next couple of chapters in Nahum. It is hard and it is uncomfortable, but God, this is your word and it is profitable for us. Teach us what you would have us to learn about you, Lord God. May it make us rejoice. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.